Okay, and we're back. Uh, thanks for uh, giving us a few minutes break. I hope you got your coffee, uh, but we're okay. gonna get started. We have Omar Elnagar here with us from WeaveChain. Uh, it is a big data on-ramp for Web3. So Omar, uh, take it away and tell us why Web2 data sucks. <laughs> it is my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me here, Cindy, and uh, thanks to everybody. It's great to be here at the World Crypto Economic Forum. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Omar Elnagar, the founder and CEO of WeChain. And today I'm going to talk to you about why your Web2 data stinks. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time uh, why they need to go and upgrade their data to Web3. And, and the problem is just that the patterns for Web2 data are fundamentally insecure, prohibiting the most interesting sharing scenarios. You know, from how data is stored at rest to how it moves, existing security patterns are just insufficient. So, you know, I talk with market data providers all the time who go and sell their data with one party who then goes and illegally shares it with 100 others. And there's nothing they can do about it because once that data is out of their hands, they've lost all control over it. And frankly, even when the data is under their control, there's no guarantee that that data hasn't been tampered with. So oftentimes if a hacker breaches your network, they're not only going to steal your assets, but they'll actually tamper with your security logs to go and cover their tracks. And the result is that some incredibly valuable data sets are being hoarded in company data centers instead of actually being utilized. It's like that fear from Indiana Jones where the final resting place of the Ark of the Covenant was in some government warehouse instead of in a research lab where it could be better understood. Now, uh, our peers over at Chainlink uh, discussed this migration from a world of paper guarantees to cryptographic guarantees. And they gave some great examples of scenarios where companies made promises that they couldn't actually keep and their vision of the future is one that's driven by uh, guarantees that are cryptographically derived. And this is one of the beautiful attributes of Web3 smart contracts is that every transaction is guaranteed and, and recorded for posterity. So I believe that Web3 is continuing the evolution of network data. Web1 was initially enabling web network data, uh, which sort of deprecated physical media like floppy disks, but the data was really siloed. Even you know, your internal CRM couldn't talk to your financial software without really complex tools like Informatica. And, and what was great about the evolution to Web2 was that suddenly everything had an API and people were forming these data lakes to go and generate incredible insights. Uh, but that data was still very rarely shared across company borders. I believe in large part due to those security concerns that we just discussed. And the evolution of Web3 is that we're going to start seeing collaborations across data that multiple companies own. IDC is calling it the global data sphere. And I think it's going to be driven uh, by these smart contracts and cryptographic guarantees uh, handling transactions. Really, I believe that Web3 data is fundamentally more secure and more valuable than its predecessors. And this idea is rooted in the fact that you're going to have verifiable claims for pretty much everything. Every bit of activity will have uh, immutability properties uh, so that you know it hasn't been tampered with. And there will be a lineage to the data so that you can see where it came from and where it's going. And you'll have certifications from trusted authorities validating this work. Now, when you think of certifications, I want you to think of the SSL certificate in your browser, for example. I can be very confident that I'm on docs.cool.com because of this SSL certificate. But frankly, I don't care a vast majority of the time unless I end up on a site that is not certified. Then I'll start getting some loud warning signs saying that you're in dangerous territory and I think you're going to see this same pattern uh, in the future whenever you're dealing with data that doesn't meet modern Web3 standards. And the beauty here is that it's going to enable a future where all digital assets are monetized. And we're going to see the emergence of, of a connected, interoperable global data sphere where it won't actually matter where the data exists, whether it's on a, you know, a, a Ethereum or Solana or a private enterprise financial or healthcare chain. Uh, as long as that data is, is safely accessible, via smart contracts to any party authorized to interact with it, uh, then it should be accessible. Now, I wanna focus a little bit on the security side of things, and then I'll touch base on this value proposition uh, one more time to, to wrap things up. Now, I believe the most secure data in the world has Web3 properties. Today, if you're gonna go and lock down some data, the easy things to do are put it behind a firewall, limit access even to those people who are inside the network, encrypt that data when it's at rest, and when it's in transit. But as Web3 technology matures, it's going to become really cheap and easy to also add on this guarantee of immutability to your data with full provenance to know who changed what and when. And you'll be able to establish a distributed defense for your data so that hackers 
can't just go and breach one environment to, to tamper with your data. They would actually, actually instead have to compromise, for example, 51% of a trust network. So in this example, three separate environments in order to really compromise your data. So let's go back to an example of somebody who's uh, trying to tamper with a data set. You have your customer with their protected environment that's behind a firewall. And instead of just leaving those logs on a regular database, let's go and put them uh, on a blockchain that's replicated with your trust network. Now in a zero trust model, you still have to assume that a hacker can breach your network, but they will not be able to tamper with those security logs so that you can understand precisely what they did and how they did it. In fact, the White House put out an executive order just last year asking all government agencies to start protecting their logs with cryptographic methods for, for precisely this reason. And it's not just the US government who's focused on leveraging Web3 technology. The NHS uh, commissioned a study in, in the UK uh, to review how it's actually managing its data and, and to figure out how they could unlock additional value from the fascinating healthcare data that they've been hoarding for decades. Now, this data is incredibly sensitive with plenty of personal health information where privacy preservation is of paramount importance. So the first step for them was creating what they refer to as trusted research environments uh, to enable uh, academics and researchers to, to safely access this data. Now, confidential computing patterns enable researchers to send uh, analytical models over to these secure government environments, have the model run there locally on the data set, and just return the results to the researcher without ever exposing the raw data to the public. There are a variety of methods for actually achieving this, uh, but unfortunately, that's a, a longer topic for, for another discussion. Another challenge that they identified here was the need to create uh, reproducible analytical pipelines for research to combat the reproducibility crisis that's happening in science uh, to ensure that results aren't being falsified. Now here again, Web3 technology can help by establishing uh, an immutable consensus-driven lineage for both uh, the data itself and the computation that's being performed on that data. Now we're excited to see these concepts manifest um, sort of at a more grassroots level in what's being referred to as the decentralized science movement. And they're bringing Web3 principles to research, both from a crowdfunding perspective and for open collaborative data. Now, your classic uh, PDF research report is nothing more than a paper guarantee that these results that you see on screen are as claimed. The team at DSI Labs is trying to uh, change that, though, by building a product that actually attaches to a PDF, uh, adding verifiable metadata to these studies. They want to be able to show the precise source data that's used uh, for this study, as well as the computational model, and have everything here vetted by trusted validators. Their vision is to create a new Web3 of science, which is almost kind of like a semantic web for research, where everything is driven by these autonomous research communities who then go and publish their data into an open library that can be dynamically accessed by anybody who's permissioned. Now, this brings me back to the, the value side of things. And I'll just give one uh, example here uh, to wrap up for how sort of economic models are, are evolving. So I'll start by talking through an example of a Web2 scenario where the insurance provider Allstate created this mobile app Arity that would measure the driving patterns uh, of consumers and say, if you are a safe driver, we are going to reduce your car insurance premiums. Now, this technology was initially uh, novel, but it has since become boilerplate such that Toyota actually builds this into every one of their cars from 2019 onwards. Now, Toyota doesn't care about selling this data to insurers. They care about understanding uh, consumer driving patterns so they can build better cars and, and sell more of them. What's interesting is that this technology is so boilerplate that pretty much every auto manufacturer is doing the same thing now. And a Web3 consortia called Mobi has come along that's trying to say, you know, what could we do if we could actually understand uh, driving data from everybody in the world at the same time? Well, we could go and do things like measure carbon emissions globally or create frameworks by which uh, autonomous vehicles could communicate with each other in real time on the road, or even just uh, provide the ability to do studies on uh, people's patterns at, at a global level. But it's very early days for this research. And we think that you know part of the key to it is ensuring that you're uh, doing that research in a way that preserves the privacy of the individuals uh, underneath it. Now at WeaveChain, um, 
we're trying to support this future uh, by making it really easy for data to gain Web3 benefits without having to go and, and lift it out of its existing databases and port it to uh, risky blockchain technology or to do any bespoke engineering. So our nodes attach directly to any database using a listener pattern or by ingesting that data via an API. And then we give that data Web3 security properties by putting hashes of that data onto any blockchain. That lets you have this beautiful immutability and computational lineage, as well as access to modern confidential computing practices. Then we facilitate access to Web3 value chains by acting as middleware so that we can publish to any Oracle without any uh, engineering efforts or uh, by letting the data be monetized directly. I think I may have even gone over time a little bit, but uh, thank you so much for your time and attention today. And, and please feel free to reach out to me uh, at omar at weavechain.com anytime to talk more. Uh, clearly, I am a giant data nerd and, and love this stuff. Thank you, so, Omar, so much for joining us today and talking to us about security, because it's just as important as all main pillars of building a product, especially in Web3. You know, we hear about hacks all the time and um, understanding how we can build a secure infrastructure and architecture in the future is like yeah, of the know, utmost importance. The, the hacks are tricky. And I, I just want to emphasize that, you know, the technology underlying blockchain is actually quite secure. But the fact that you can instantly transfer money from one wallet to another in a way that's irreversible is really the source of, of a lot of those challenges with those hacks. So it's a, a lot of social engineering more than uh, flaws in, in the underlying technology itself. Oh, interesting. Wow. Well, that's like really good to know. Um, <laughs> social engineering is like uh, a huge mystery to me. It, it's like you don't really know where the tipping point is actually going to be. So. All right, well, thank you so much. If you could just hang back for a few minutes, there might be some questions for you in the comments. Sure thing.